This episode of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is brought to you by Got Science, a new podcast from the Union of Concerned Scientists, which is a nonprofit science advocacy group with over 20,000 members. Learn more about their new show over at gotsciencepodcast.org. Wired.com presents The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. And here is your host, David Barr Kirtley. Hello, and welcome to episode 275 of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. Today on the show, we'll be discussing the anthology The Best American Science Fiction and Fantasy 2017. And if you missed them, you should also go check out our panel on The Best American Science Fiction and Fantasy 2015, back in episode 177, featuring Joe Hill, and our panel on The Best American Science Fiction and Fantasy 2016, back in episode 224, featuring Karen Joy Fowler. And I'm joined by two guests. So first up, we've got our producer, John Joseph Adams. He's the editor of Lightspeed and Nightmare Magazines, and he also oversees John Joseph Adams' books, an imprint of Houghton Mifflin Harcourt. He's the series editor of The Best American Science Fiction and Fantasy, and he's also edited many other anthologies, including the recent books Cosmic Powers and What the Bleep is That? So, John, welcome back. Uh, best American greetings to everyone. <laughs> And also joining us today is Charles Yu, who you may remember from our feature interview back in episode 24. He's the author of the novel How to Live Safely in a Science Fictional Universe and the short story collection Sorry, Please, Thank You and Third Class Superhero. He also worked as a scriptwriter and story editor for season one of the HBO series Westworld and served as guest editor for Best American Science Fiction and Fantasy 2017. So, Charlie, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. And today's show is brought to you by Got Science, a new podcast from the Union of Concerned Scientists. Last week, I talked about how the UCS is on the front lines, fighting the Trump administration's many attempts to suppress scientific information and punish scientists who tell the truth. That's obviously a really important issue, and the UCS definitely needs as much support on that as you can give them. But the Got Science podcast doesn't only focus on bad news. I just listened to two episodes that discuss some of the ways that science and technology are making our lives better. Episode 3 is called The Ultimate Designated Driver, and it covers some of the implications of self-driving cars that you might not have thought of. For example, a constantly roving fleet of autonomous taxis might make many parking lots obsolete, freeing up that space for more housing parks and schools, and might also give low-income workers more options when it comes to finding jobs and other opportunities by providing cheap, flexible transportation. And you can learn more about that from Jimmy O'Day, one of UCS's clean vehicle experts, in Episode 3 of the Got Science Podcast. I'd also recommend episode 15, Sunbeam Us Up, which features senior energy analyst John Rogers explaining what you need to know to install solar panels on your roof. So I think those are both really interesting topics, and you can go listen to those episodes of the Got Science Podcast right now over on iTunes or by going to gotsciencepodcast.org. So again, the URL is gotsciencepodcast.org. All right, so now let's get to our panel. Okay, and so I just mentioned in the intro that we had Charlie on the show all the way back in episode 24 which was back in 2010. So, Charlie, I don't know. Do you even remember that? It was a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I do. It was. I was in a different house. I was, uh, and I, I feel honored to be. I was sort of there, you know, when the show was pretty young, like toddler age. <laughs> Although, uh, I don't know if that's weird. A pod can a podcast be a toddler? <laughs> it was, now you're grown up. You're a grown up podcast. Yeah, that was back when John and I were all socially awkward and everything. But for, 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 <laughs> we're, uh, now the show's always just totally smooth and professional sounding. Yeah, back then that was before uh, before our parent uh, actually disowned us and given had given up on us, uh, <laughs> and, and we had to find a new parent, and then and then another new parent after that. But we don't have to go into that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can all you can all go check out episode one hundred for the history of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy to learn all about our <laughs> multiple orphaning of this podcast but um but yeah so i wanted to ask charlie kind of what have you been up to since 2010 um well uh, yeah it's been a been a long seven years in some ways uh we've you know, my children have gotten much bigger <laughs> hmm. uh i i have stopped being a lawyer and am now writing full-time i think when we talked last time i was sort of doing both. I was definitely doing both. And uh, since then, I've had the good fortune of being able to uh, write for TV, which is now sort of my day job, and I'm still writing fiction. So that there's been that. And, uh, and yeah, as you, as you mentioned, um, I, Dave, I, I 
was lucky enough to work on the first season of Westworld, which was my first job in TV and was just um, eye opening and it was mind blowing and I learned a ton and I also you know kind of it broke my brain several times, <laughs> um, but uh, really rewarding in a lot of ways too. So how did that happen that you started writing for TV? Um, I still don't know, really. I mean, <laughs> I guess uh, <laughs> luck. I mean, I kind of won won the lottery in you know some ways. I I, I guess I I met a, an executive at HBO named David Levine who was uh, really I think probably instrumental in me even being considered. And then when they were having staffing, you know, when they were starting to meet people to staff for the writers' room of of Westworld, um, my name somehow was on a list probably through David and. Uh, and so I went in and met with, uh, Lisa Joy and Jonathan Nolan, the showrunners and co-creators of that, of the TV series of Westworld. Uh, obviously Michael Crichton was the originator of, you know, of the, back when it was a feature. But, um, so Lisa and, um, and Jonah, they brought me in to meet and for whatever reason, liked me enough to give me a <laughs> shot. I was this kind of weird <laughs> novelist, you know, like, uh, failed poet. <laughs> experimental literary fiction writer pretty much useless in every way other than <laughs> other other than maybe to write for a show like that which you know i mean i've i think i've joked with john about this but um i, I basically write meta science fiction and i mean that's not the only thing i write but it's one of the things i write and um, john pointed out that in some ways you could take a couple of my stories and and marry them and that it might be something close to what westworld you know, sort of is, or at least plays in that space. So I, uh, I like to think I got maybe the only job I've ever really been qualified for in, <laughs> in or sort of qualified for in, in landing in that staff. Um, not to say I, I, I knew what I was doing when I got in there for sure. It was, it was, uh, it was like being thrown into, you know, a deep pool and, uh, it was scary, but it was also really exhilarating to get to do that. I mean, is there anything in the show you could point to and say, Oh, that's something that I added into the script or something? Um, I mean, I, you know, I don't, I think there's kind of a ethos and, and right, rightfully so because uh, of not, uh, uh, you know, I, I would be hesitant to, to say that's mine. It was really Lisa and Jonah's creation, but, but I, I, I'd like to think that I, and, 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 you know, as, uh, as writer, as, as a good writer's room works, it, a lot of the best ideas really come from a kind of um collective effort that you know you'll it, it'll it's really neat to watch how someone can pitch something you know and it's kind of in this adjacent space but but it kind of zigs and zags through you know different iterations and it'll bounce off of and everyone will sort of start pitching into this idea and you know two minutes later you might end up in this other space and go wow you know that initial pitch you know, helped by the next three or four things eventually turned into a really cool thing. So all of which is to say it's hard to point to certain things. I, I mean, I, I can say what I was obsessed with, which was, you know, a couple of the aspects of of the kind of uh, theme park of it all. I mean, that's definitely been, you know, any kind of simulated reality or play acting or um, uh, that aspect of it. I've written a lot of or I've tried to write a lot of stories that that play in that space of some kind of manufactured reality. So that the idea of both a workplace where the 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 output is to uh is to create, you know, a reality for for paying customers was always really appealing to me. So I you know, I like to I like to read stuff on my own already about um about AI and about some of that stuff and I I try to bring some of the philosophy and thinking about consciousness into the room and hopefully it it was useful if nothing else it 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 often had the effect of derailing useful conversations <laughs> that the tv writers were having um so so that that was probably my main contribution was to bring everything to a screeching halt with my <laughs> ridiculous um you know highfalutin ideas about consciousness that were usually you know, usually like, oh, that's great. But um, how do we show that on TV? <laughs> like, oh, yeah, right. So. so. So were other people on the show interested in prose science fiction or was that kind of your wheelhouse? 
Um, no, they definitely, I'd say as readers and as uh, writers, they're definitely, for sure. I, specifically prose, it's hard to say. I mean, I think um, Jonah is a huge, you know, fan, I think, and, and really well read in lots of things, including science fiction. We had Ed Brubaker, the, you know, um, writer was in the room. And he's, I guess he's, he's more of a crime writer, but certainly in terms of prose writing, you know, that we, we, there were other um, non, you know, or, or uh, people other than me who were not just TV writers, but um, yeah, I was probably the only actual prose science fiction writer in the room. That's, which was, you know, made me feel like I had, you know, even though I had no TV experience and really didn't know what I was doing, it, I did bring some kind of, uh, different viewpoint for what it was worth. Mm -hmm. And I was just curious, you, you mentioned, was it David Levine, the HBO executive that you met with initially? Um, how did that meeting right. come about? That happened, um, uh, through, so after I published, um, my novel, uh, how to live safely, then I started to, you know, very occasionally, like once or twice a year, have a meeting with someone in Hollywood, the kind of thing of like, Oh, you know, hello, Mr. Fiction person. Would you mm -hmm. ever be interested in turning your stuff into movies or TV? And it's like, Oh, of course, that'd be great. And I go in there wide eyed and very clueless and, but over the course of, you know, two, three, four years, those meetings got a little bit more productive in that I, st I started to think more seriously about doing it. And at one of them, he happened to be there. I was meeting with a couple of executives um, and he he just actually happened to be at that meeting. And um, and so I met him and I didn't think much of it. But then like a year later, um, I found myself, you know, going into meet for Westworld and I put two and two together and I figured that that was the only way that they would have, I would have been on their radar, I think. So mm -hmm. see, John, do you have anything you've always wanted to know about Westworld? Uh, I mean, I have a lot of questions, but uh, I don't, I mean, I don't want to uh, derail our panel by doing a whole uh, Q and a with one of the writers of Westworld. Uh, but uh, <laughs> you know, and of course I, it's been quite a while since I watched it. I watched it when it first aired and uh, I feel like I need to do a rewatch before I could really adequately prepare all my questions. Um, I mean, a lot of them get answered by the end of the first season, but, uh, but I, I you know, as, as you know, Dave, from when we did our panel on, on the first couple episodes of Westworld, I have a lot of questions about like the safety protocols and such <laughs> like that, but, um, you know, we don't need to delve into that too much. <laughs> <laughs> All right, cool. So yeah, so let's then move on to, uh, best American science fiction and fantasy. So John, last time that we talked to you about this series, I think you said right that you had gotten a two book contract, and then mm -hmm. depending on sales, it would gonna it was gonna be two more books, and so there are mm -hmm. now gonna be two more books, right? So the sales have been have been good enough to justify that. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, it hasn't set the world on fire or anything, but um, you know, I mean, we're leaving that to the uh, current administration here in the United States. But um, <laughs> you know, um, yeah, it, I mean, we got we got the second two book deal, so we, you know, there's going to be four. So uh, this is the first of those, and then next year we'll have another one, and then you know, hopefully we'll get continue to renew it. I mean, I think HMH has been pretty uh, happy with how it's been going so far. Um, so hopefully we can keep it going for a long time. But, uh, but yeah, that's where, that's where things stand as far as that goes. Um, I can't announce the new guest editor yet, unfortunately. Um, I, I, I always, I always, like, we have the person lined up, but I always want to, like, announce it just as soon as we, as soon as we find out, as soon as we sign the contract. But, um, HMH has their ways of, you know, <laughs> holding on to news to announce later for whatever reason. So I have to trust them. They've been doing this a long time, like a hundred years or whatever. So <laughs> I guess, uh, they've had a lot of practice. So how did you pick Charlie to be the guest editor for uh, the third volume? Uh, well, every one of these um, decisions is always like this big brainstorming session about like the type of writer we want to go for. And, and I mean, Charlie is uh, is one of those great um, sort of crossover type of authors where like, you know, he has a lot of like this literary credibility, like, you know, because his book was published uh, mainly as a mainstream type book, even though it's obviously science fiction, it has science fiction right in the name of it. Um, but um and, and I mean, I love his work. I mean, I, I love the novel and, uh, you know, I, you know, um, I solicited a story from him way back in the day and, uh, when Lightspeed first launched. It was like our first year and, um, he had a standard loneliness package in, uh, like one of the first issues. Like I think it was like an issue four or five or something like that. Um, so I mean, I've been a fan for a long time and, uh, and, you know, um, 
the the stories that he mentioned uh, that that if you combine them, it kind of makes Westworld. Uh, I published both of those in anthologies also. So you know, I mean, he's been somebody I've been a fan of for a long time. Um, and you know, any one of these decisions, like, well, there's so many people that we could that we would love to you know do one of these things, like to be a guest editor sometime. And it's like uh, it's just a matter of like figuring out, like, okay, well, who do we want to ask now? Um, and uh, yeah, and then there's just, like, deliberations, and, and, you know, I mean, I have ideas, and then HMH has ideas, and we just have to come together on a, you know, thing that we all agree on that's a good idea. And in this case, it was, a, it was an easy decision, because everybody was on board when, once I threw his name out there. Mm -hmm. And so, Charlie, just talk a little bit about, from your perspective, what was it like to get contacted by John? Like, how did that happen, and what did you, did you have, did you have any uh, nervousness about whether you would have time to read the stories or anything like that? Yeah, no, it was really exciting. I mean, um, I I always like seeing John. You know, you, some names you see in your inbox, and it's <laughs> a little bit of dread. But when John's name pops up in my inbox. It's almost always a good thing. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, it's always it's always a good thing so far. Um, and uh, so, and then when I started reading it, I was like, oh, this is. I mean, I I think I immediately had two feelings. Like one, I have to do this. I this is like something that in a way I've always kind of dreamed of doing, you know, that I've always liked the best American series and to do it in this, you know, the, the science fiction and fantasy space is like, it just seemed great. And then the, the simultaneously feeling like, Oh, you know, like, how am I going to do like one? I think I felt like, am I really qualified to do this? Hmm. Um, do I read enough in the genre? Do I, and also it, I knew it would be a lot of work. Um, but but no, I'm, it was so rewarding to be able to do it. So uh, I'm, I'm really glad I took on the challenge. And, and John was, you know, I think John does all the work, actually. And, and mm -hmm. I get the pleasure of reading a bunch of already, you know, already curated stories. So I get to read really the best um, of, of what's out there, I think. Right. So the process briefly, right, is that John reads a couple thousand stories and picks 80. And then you read those and pick the best 20, right? Are my right. numbers right there? When you put it when you put it that way, then it really does put it into focus. Because <laughs> I mean, I can't even I, reading eighty really kind of like it. It was it's hard. <laughs> like you know, for I, I've read stories for contests and and things here and there, and or just pleasure reading or reading for you know blurbing people's books. But this really felt like, uh, not to say I, I don't always give great attention to everything I do, but. <laughs> Uh, I felt like I really owed it to, you know, these 80 to make sure that. I, and so it was um, I had to I had to kind of bear down and, and read them in batches and make sure they were getting the attention they deserve. But, yeah, I, I can't. John, what's that like to um, <laughs> like, how do you read a couple thousand stories? Is it continuous reading or is it like. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, definitely it's uh, continuous reading, but um, but also, you know, um, I, I it's not fair to say that I read that many like those thousands of stories i at least start thousands of stories you know and and i mean the the number of stories that i actually finish reading is much lower because of course you know once i start a story and i uh realize that it's not really doing it for me well then i can stop reading it because it's clearly not going to be the best of the year if i'm not even really into reading it that initial time um so you know it's it's kind of similar to like when you're reading uh unsolicited submissions for for a magazine or, or whatever um but uh, but but almost to it like a greater it's almost it's like you have even more impetus to bail like if you're not into it because it's like well there's stories where it's like oh well maybe if I'm if I'm considering this for in a magazine for an original story it's like well uh you know if it has something going for it but it's not quite there it's like well maybe I can work with the author and I can fix it or whatever like you know there's that's a factor that you have to consider uh, whereas when I'm reading for Best American it's like well. I mean, these stories are published and I can't change them. Like literally best Americans policy is like, you know, you can't change anything. Like they don't even want to change. They don't, they, they're even hesitant to sort of fix obvious typos, um, you know, cause it's like, Oh, well that's how it originally appeared. That's how it should be, you know? Um, and um, so, so, you know, I mean, if it's not, if it's not great already, then I can just stop reading it. So, I mean, that's, that's one way that I get through it. But then also I have, um, I have some helpers who, uh, who can sort of help me get through, um, they go through and they read through everything. And, and, you know, if, if anything stands out to them, then I'll go check it out. Or, you know, maybe based on some other comments, I might check out something else, um, even if they didn't like it or, or if it's an author that I normally like, um, you know, that kind of thing.
Well, well, John, you mentioned, or uh, you know, there are a couple publications in this book that I was not familiar with or barely familiar with, like BuzzFeed Reader, Beloit Journal, and The Sun. Could you talk about some of those, like more sure. not typical science fiction kind of things that you pulled stories from? Sure. Uh, so I can't claim that I knew about Beloit Fiction Journal. Um, that one, uh, that story, Openness by Alexander Weinstein, um, was actually in his collection. Um, which was called like children of the of a, of the new world, world or something or, like that of the children of the new world yeah that's it um and and that had just come out from like a, a major mainstream publisher and so like I'd gotten a review copy and I was like oh this looks interesting and so you know I, so I checked out that book because you know it was this he was this uh it was this book that was obviously science fiction or at least largely science fiction and uh, I was like I didn't know who this author was and so I you know it was all new to me but as it turns out that story um also appeared in the same year as the book. Uh, so, um, you know, by the time I discovered in the collection, it was still eligible for Best American because, you know, uh, it first appeared that same year. Um, so I, I don't really know anything about that particular journal, but um, that's how I discovered that one. Um, the Sun um, is is like a mainstream uh, publication, and I guess they've um, they've always had this fiction section where like they publish one fiction story per issue or something like that. Um, and uh, I don't know, Debbie Urbanski has sold them a bunch of stories, um, and um, uh, I don't know how much science fiction they publish. I mean, they've at least been publishing a couple of hers. Um, and she sort of uh, burst onto the scene, like I think maybe either last year or the year before, um, and has a, has had a bunch of stories in various publications. Like I've I've bought a couple from her as well, b besides the Best American stuff. Um, but um, you know, one of the things I do to try to help find uh, material is I have like an open open submission system that people can send uh, Best American stories to. Uh, you know, and I just, I invite people to send whatever they want, you know, and it's like, um, you know, again, I have some, uh, sort of helpers try to sort through all that stuff, uh, but anyway, Debbie had sent those, uh, sun stories through there, and, and, you know, I didn't actually know about them otherwise, so I'm, I'm always glad to have, uh, you know, that kind of discovery, um, for BuzzFeed Reader, yeah, I don't know how much fiction they publish. I mean, I guess that's a, I mean, I guess that's a regular thing, but I mean, I don't know how much science fiction ends up, uh, in there. Um, that was one where, um, you know, I mean, I follow Ella Sola Kim on Twitter and, and, you know, I've, I published her before. Actually, she was, uh, she may have been in the same issue as Charlie, actually, come to think of it, of Lightspeed back in the day. But I mean, she's certainly a very early, um, Lightspeed, uh, author. Um, and, uh, and, you know, I think she just posted a link to it when it, came, when it came out, or, or maybe I saw somebody else talking about it. I mean, that's one of the ways I also, um, hunt around for, uh, those sort of, um, uh, out of the way places that publish a science fiction story is, uh, you know, I, I pay attention to social media. I follow a lot of writers and, and stuff like that. So, um, you know, occasionally those people will discover whatever that story is in this like mainstream venue or, or the, or the like. And, um, and, you know, so I make note of it and I go check them out. I'm always really curious to check out things like that because it's like, um, you, you don't know, you don't really know what to expect from, from those things. And, and, um, in a lot of cases, the, the genre readers won't have encountered it because it's in this non-genre place. So uh, I like to find things like that if I can. Yeah. Well, and so Charlie, so you're getting all these stories with no information, right, about where they were published or who wrote them. Um, so what's exactly. that like? And I thought it was interesting, actually, that there are two stories in this book from the same author. Did you have any idea that they were from the same author when you were reading them? No, I did not. I'm not like I'm not one of those wine tasters who could identify <laughs> the vintage, apparently. <laughs> Uh, which, you know, I, there were, there were some where I, I wondered if this was the same person. Um, but I, th I, I, if I recall, I don't know that I would have called that one. I mean, looking at it, looking at it in retrospect, then, you know, you can certainly see stylistically, oh, things, oh, maybe I should have picked up on this or that, but probably says as much about the writer too. But yeah, I, to your, you know, to the original question, it's, I don't get any information. I get, um, I guess basically like a Dropbox, right? John, wasn't it in Dropbox mm -hmm. of like mm -hmm. files that are stripped of any kind of identifying information. And so, um, I'm really reading blind. And in this case, my, uh, either lack of time and lack of, uh, you know, current reading in, in the journals helps, I think, because I, there were very few, I think there might have been, you know, a, a couple of places where I, I, you know, certain magazines I tend to read, but for whatever reason, and maybe this says, I maybe 
John should be mad at me because it means I'm not reading light speed enough. But <laughs> but during the during two thousand you know, during the eligibility period, I apparently wasn't reading much of anything because very few of these stories popped out at me as something I had read before. So it was really neat to be able to say, you know, I, I have no idea who this is. This could be uh, you know, a really, really famous and, you know, award-winning science fiction writer, or this could be someone who this is literally, you know, their first publication or something. And mm-hmm. so that was cool. Right. Well, I guess I'll say the two stories by the same author are both by Dale Bailey. It's I Was a Teenage Werewolf and uh, what's the other teenager thing? Uh, teenagers mm-hmm. from Outer Space, which I, I guess he said in his author's note that he took titles from old movies and was trying to and use was using those as springboards and trying to kind of decampify them. Um, and, and, you know, take, take these sort of campy titles, but then tell very, very serious moving stories, which I think you definitely succeeded in. Um, but it's interesting, Charlie, when you talk about maybe you could have identified them from the stylistic similarities, because actually the, these two stories by Dale Bailey have quite different styles, actually, because um, one of them is first person plural uh, divided into titled sections which is a kind of interesting way to, in, in, in an unusual way to tell a story. And it's kind of funny because there's another story in this book um, when they mm-hmm. came to us that also is first person plural with titled right. sections. So I thought that was kind of interesting. I, I wondered if maybe I'm, I'm thinking of that is I, I thought, well, but you know, that could be the same person, but that would be almost too obvious because if someone's doing that that often, it would be surprising <laughs> since it's already not that common a sort of point of view to write from. But um the i think maybe the kind of the the two dale bailey stories i think maybe other than the word teenagers um a clue could have been uh the just sort of the tone and the way that they sort of both evoke this uh this kind of timelessness they almost feel like mythic stories in a way that like uh, they for me they captured a slice of sort of uh a place and time very well and, uh, but yeah, I, it says a lot about somebody that can write so differently. You know, I, I personally think that, and, and I've had people tell me this, like from the, from like the opening paragraph of something, they can usually tell I wrote it. <laughs> uh, it, it just, it just has my fingerprint all over it. And I, that for better or worse, that seems like, oh, maybe I should get some new tricks, but um, <laughs> it's very impressive that, that you wrote both of those stories for sure. Well, yeah, they're both set in the kind of 50s, it seemed to me, as sort of alternate 50s or mythological 50s. Right. right. And uh, and just capturing that, you know, feeling that and said in the thing about the old movie titles, that's really neat, too. It just it really does kind of feel like, oh, um, I, I already kind of get this sense of atmosphere, you know, through through the title. And, and then you're you're already in it from, you know, from the first line. Yeah, and Dale Bailey is one of those writers. I mean, I've read I've read almost all of his stuff. Um, and and it, it, he's one of those writers who almost every story is just completely different. And um, I mean, I think the more you read of him, the more you would pick up on some of his stylistic um sort of quirks or um you know his his fingerprints. Um, but uh, but yeah, I mean, like his stories are very frequently just like completely different than each other. I mean, even though like as you say in this case, um, you know, he's doing a particular thing with both of these two stories, and and they both kind of set in this uh, sort of pseudo fifties or or whatever it is, this alternate fifties, um. But, uh, but yeah, he's really interesting. Um, uh, and actually, if I can get in a quick plug, I, I just bought his novel for my novel imprint, uh, that'll be coming out, uh, um, in uh, September next year. It's called In the Nightwood. So, I mean, if people pick up this book and they check out these two stories and they think he's great, then, uh, they should definitely check that out. Wow. That's exciting. Is it in a similar, is the novel in a similar vein to these stories or is it something uh, completely different? Yeah, no, it's something completely different. So, 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 sort of to my point that he's, uh, you know, he goes all over the place in terms of what he uh, focuses on. But, um, yeah, it's it's compl- it's completely different. It's a contemporary story. It's um, it's it's very um, uh, sort of literary in focus. It's like a sort of um, uh, sort of dark fantasy story about um, a book um, and um, the 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 strange figure that is the subject of this book that uh, that the narrator finds and that sort of. Uh, sucks him into this uh, trap of uh, sort of trying to investigate all this weird stuff that starts happening to him uh, uh, surrounding this book and everything. Hmm. Well, I mean, Charlie used the term meta science fiction, <laughs> and certainly there's a lot of metafictional stuff going on in these stories. Um, 
So I don't know, Charlie, is that an expression of your taste, do you think? Or were the stories that you were drawing from, was there a high amount of metafiction going on in the in the 80s stories, even that John passed to you? I don't know. I, John could probably answer that better than I can. But I, I have a feeling that it reflects... Um, I, I mean, I'd like to think that I that you know my, my taste is you know so other something other people would like, but but yeah, mm-hmm. when when I step back and look at how much you know of the, certain elements are in kind of in these stories, yeah, and, and I think that's maybe you know, and it's something that's unavoidable, right? I mean, I, I hope John feels the same way that that one maybe one purpose of a guest editor is that they have a certain kind of taste. So I think Karen Joy Fowler said it last year. It's at, at some level, it's going to be about subjective, you know, taste. Um, you, you, the, the 80 stories there, it was, you know, I told you on this, it, you know, it was incredible. Like the uniformity of like craft and of, you know, I, I just almost without exception, I just found these stories to be really excellent. So it was really hard to choose. So you know, I, I guess I leave it to John to say whether or not I picked like mm-hmm. an over over a disproportionate amount of meta stuff. <laughs> Maybe I, my yeah, my preferences might be showing a little bit. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I wouldn't say um, that it was too high a proportion or anything. And and I mean, I'd have to go back and look at um, you know the whole A, B, and C, like what percentage of of those types of stories actually. Uh, you know, ended up in the book versus what was represented in that 80 overall. But I mean, um, I, I didn't, you know, it's kind of funny, like in, I, in retrospect, like, I mean, I didn't, I didn't do it on purpose to put uh, that, like a large percentage uh, of those types of stories in there. But I mean, I do actually also tend to go for that stuff myself. So um, I'm not surprised to see it, um, you know, see, see it well represented. Um, I mean, I did a whole anthology about uh, fictional Kickstarter projects. So, you know, I mean, it's like kind of a thing that I, uh, I enjoy. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, and then, but, uh, also in retrospect, like, you know, I, I talk about this in the, in, in the forward, um, you know, um, seeing some of the picks that Charlie made, it's like, well, yeah, no, of course he loved that story. It's like, it, it pushes the same buttons that his stories push, you know? Um, or, uh, it just, it's like, it's like such an, it's, it's like doing something in an adjacent space to the, to the same types of stories that he writes, you know? So, um. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I thought that was interesting. Although, like I said, in retrospect, it seems kind of obvious. Like, well, naturally, he would like that story. <laughs> and I don't mean to um, make it sound like, I mean, looking at the list of story, the table of contents here in this beautiful book that I have, um, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, if I recall, it, there aren't. It's not as if I don't want people listening to this or you know considering buying this to think this is like a an, a metafiction anthology. I, I actually mm-hmm. don't think you know in plenty of these stories probably most of them don't really have that element. I think one thing that maybe they do have that I I might be conflating with meta is just that I really liked a lot of things that did something exciting with form where, you know, something Mm -hmm, really mm -hmm. surprising either or some other element of, you know, of storytelling, whether it was form or their point of view, you know, we mentioned your, you mentioned the, the kind of the, the POV of, you know, the sort of first person plural of a couple of the stories and things that just, you know, in, um, in a sea of like excellent stories, certain things stand out where you're like immediately grabbed by some element of the storytelling that, that makes it, uh, that just jogs parts of your brain that you, or or your heart that haven't, you know, been jogged in a while, I guess. Well, right. Do you want to talk about what some of those stories are that are most experimental in their form? I mean, obviously the, um, the choose your own adventure story, um, you know, jumps out at me as an example of that. It's called Welcome to the Medical Clinic at the Interplanetary Relay Station, Hours Since the Last Patient Death Zero. <laughs> um, by Carol. I'm not her, how do you pronounce this name, John? Carolyn M. Yoshim? Uh, Carolyn M. Yokum. Yokum. Okay. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so so that was obviously a, a really, you know, experimental one with the form. Um, are there other ones, Charlie, that or do you want to talk about that one or any others that did interesting things with form? Yeah, no, I, I mean, I, a couple of them. I think, uh, everyone from Themis, is it Themis or Themis? I feel like I should definitely know how to pronounce that. <laughs> everyone from that place sends letters home. Yeah. Um, that, you know, that was a, if I remember, it's a pretty long story. Um, mm-hmm. a lot of these are pretty long stories and it's told through a bunch of different, um, kind of like in retrospective reports. Uh, if I recall, it's, 
but but also letters and maybe emails i think it, it it's just sort of um a collage of different i guess primary sources that coalesce around um but but it just keeps um it, and there's really quite a varied mix of like tone and style even within the story which is great i mean it because they're supposed to be from different points of view but it lo- sort of layers its complexity and uh I thought that was amazing i thought um the story the venus effect was uh it, these are both sort of science fiction stories um I don't know if that one was so much about form for me, but it was just the the voice stood out as, uh, uh, and, and I guess in a larger sense, it's about form in that. Um, I, I don't want to spoil it, but you, you're taking. You're, I was drawn in by this kind of powerful voice that's that throughout the course of the story starts to turn inward or maybe toward toward the reader, almost like toward a. Uh, I don't, I really don't want to spoil it, but it, 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 there's something very interesting happens with the narrator's voice in the story that, that as you go on, it gave me sort of goosebumps and also, uh, the, the increasing depth and power of the story reveals itself throughout. So I don't know if you had anything to add on, on that, John. Well, I would just jump in on the Venus effect and just say like that story, like that is one of my favorite, that's one of the favorite things I've ever published, I think. Like I just love that story so much. And I was like, when, I, and I actually originally published it in Lightspeed. So, um, you know, so it's like a double sort of pride thing for me is like both, both I originally published it and also I'm proud that it's in this book. But, and I was so glad that like you loved it as much as I did, Charlie. And it's like, I know it's like when we, when we were talking about it and, uh, you know, uh, you, you sent some rankings over of things and it's like, oh, yes, yes, he loves it as much as I did. I was so excited. Um, and, uh, but, um, you know, when, when I first came out, it's like, I mean, like nobody paid any attention to it. And I was like, oh, like mm-hmm. everyone's missing the boat on this one, man. And like, I was, I was like trying to flog it as much as I could, you know, to make people realize that it was this really special thing. And, um, uh, yeah, it didn't really get, um, any attention. Um, uh, so I mean, I, like, again, I was really glad that, uh, Charlie saw how great it was, but, um, I, I did see, like, uh, it didn't get nominated for the Hugo, but, um, after the Hugo, uh, uh, winners, um, were announced, they released, like, the sort of long list of things that, like, you can see how many nominations something got. And I was pleased to see it actually did get a lot of nominations. Like, it, it, it was about 20 nominations away from actually making the ballot or something like that. Maybe 20 or 30, something, you know. So it got, like, 50 nominations. So, I mean, that was pretty good. Um, it's, uh, uh, so I mean I was glad to see that at least, but I think it was maybe too little, too late. I I I I started um, uh, second guessing myself. Like, oh, I shouldn't have published it in December. Should should have published it earlier in the year. Should have saved it. You know, but um, you know, that's just part of the publishing game, <laughs> knowing when to do things and and all that. Right, but it is a very a real tour de force of metafictional yeah. artistry. That story. Yeah. So it wins a GGG award is the point. That's, <laughs> yeah. that that's the award that really matters. Yeah. Right. right it right. really is. Yeah. Uh, and that was Joseph Allen Hill, right? Am I getting mm-hmm. his name yep. right? Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. I'm really super one. excited about him. Yeah. Right. I was just, and then the other story I mentioned uh, was by Genevieve Valentine, the everyone from, from Themis <laughs> since letters home. Right. Um, and, you know, I, I, I felt like, yeah, and those are on the science fiction side. On the on the fantasy side, I think there was maybe a little bit less of that. Um, I, I feel like for me, a lot of the stories were were just really well told uh, fantasy stories that didn't necessarily break form too much. I mean, they they always did something interesting, but uh, you know, what, a story that stood out for me was um, "Head Scales, Tail Tongue" by Lee Bardugo. Uh, I don't think of that. I think for me that, that I would describe that as a, a, a fantasy story that, that just is almost perfectly told basically. And the ending is, is just, I, I mean, I, I, it's still with me. It's just so powerful and moving and, um, unexpected yet inevitable, you know, that kind of old chestnut about what a, what an ending should do, but it really, uh, really incredible. Yeah, I, I agree. That story has a, I mean, I don't want to, it's probably spoiling it just to say this, but it has a twist and I, I didn't mm-hmm. see it. Co- I, 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 it took me a lot longer to see it coming than I should have. And when mm-hmm. I saw I was like, oh, why, duh, why didn't I see that? Uh, yeah, mm-hmm. but it's, it's very, you know, 
I have no excuse for not seeing it because it's, it's it's set up very uh you know effectively. Yeah, that uh, I, I, that was another story that I just really really loved and was really glad to see how much Charlie liked it and and you know of course obviously both that and the Venus effect you could see how much we liked it because we put it first and last in the book you know and that's sort of an anthologist uh, trick you know where you sort of you can show your favorites by putting uh you know one first and one last and all that. Um, but uh, that was also another really happy discovery for me, like, or sort of happy accident to discover that story. Cause it, um, summer days and summer nights, the anthology that it appeared in, it's a YA anthology. And a lot of it is not genre. I mean, I think, I think only two stories in that book were genre, including this one. So there was this one and there was like a Lev Grossman story. Um, and I think the rest of it was all non genre. So, I mean, I was just happy to have found it at all. Um, or just relieved that I found it at all. Cause I mean, I would have hate to have missed out on that. Um, and, and 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 that's one of those you know again one of those pleasures of discovery uh you know when you know it's like you expect to find a, a great thing in like Asimov's or Tor.com and that kind of thing but then like when you find one of these where it's like oh wow this just looks so great and and it wasn't in a venue I was necessarily expecting to find something so mm -hmm. And then another thing that kind of struck me about this book is that there are these pairs of stories that kind of seem to go together um mm -hmm. so i mean to pick mm -hmm. an obvious example there's the story not by wardrobe tornado or looking glass and the story this is not a wardrobe door which mm -hmm. both kind of deal with the idea of portal fantasy sort of um something unfulfilling happening involving a portal fantasy kind of story mm -hmm. yeah i loved i loved this is not a wardrobe do door as well uh it the this is a uh, in kind of a I guess a, a, a city that starts starts out feeling pretty, you know, it, it well, you, you know, it's going to take you somewhere weird, but it starts out feeling like a city. And then the, there are these sort of magical doorways um, that uh, work or not, or don't work depending on who you are, apparently. And uh, it, it gets you to, it, it, it really ends up in a weird place, but it is interesting that two stories with the word wardrobe <laughs> there. Um, and two teenager stories too, I guess. Yeah. Had. Yeah. So I'll, I'll just say, so in, in one story, basically the premise is that you've always wanted to go through a magic doorway to a, you know, magical realm and every, it's happening to everyone else except you. And you're like, Oh, am I ever going to be the one or am I just going to be left behind while everyone else goes off on their amazing adventures? And then the other one is there's characters who have traveled through these portals in the past and all of a sudden they stop working. And then there's this, uh, you know, Problem, you know this 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 uh, conflict of oh no I, I already had this this amazing thing and now it's being taken away from me, um, mm -hmm. which are which you know you don't see those those things in portal fantasy so much. Right, right. They need a portal repair person. Is what they need. <laughs> that, that, I'll write that story next. Yeah, no, that sounds like something out of a Charles U. Story. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> my portal is broken. <laughs> Um, and then also the story on the fringes of the fractal kind of resonated with, uh, the story Casper, do you look and bill, what are you going to do in both being these kind of satirical stories, um, about kind of media and consumer culture mm. and, and that kind of stuff. Um, and I both, I liked both those stories quite a bit. Oh, well, yeah. And like I, uh, and you could also pair Casper D. Luck and Bill and, um, and Openness by Alexander Weinstein, which I, and I mentioned this in the introduction. It's like, they both feel like Black Mirror episodes, essentially. Uh, I mean, Openness maybe isn't quite dark enough to be Black Mirror, but Casper D. Luck and Bill definitely is. Yes. Yeah, yeah you, for sure. <laughs> well, yeah. So let's say, so in this story, there is a guy and he's randomly targeted by terrorists who basically hack every, um, screen that he looks at to show him, Suff, you know, people suffering around the world that he should be doing something about or that his, you know, um, first world lifestyle is, uh, mm -hmm. um, you know, being an accessory to or something like that. And, be and he's in this future where there's screens everywhere. So this is a really, really big problem if, uh, if all the screens around you are being hijacked. Um, yeah. And actually, there was there's a quite a bit of technology in some of these stories that actually seems like it could actually happen. Um, and the in, in this story, there's something called Ubervision, which is basically they kind of spray your whole house, the whole inside of your house mm -hmm. with stuff that turns it all into that allows it to be screens, digital screens. And I don't know, that's something I could see happening some some yeah. form of that in the future. 
Yeah, I really like the the uh, protagonist sort of uh, sort of justifying it to himself, like the ridiculousness of of having that. And it's also like, well, you know, sometimes you're on the toilet and you just want to see what's in the refrigerator and without <laughs> having to get up. And you know, and it's like, and, and it's like, yeah, no, I totally feel you, man. Like I I ha I've had those same stupid thoughts about like, ah, this thing it just could be a little bit more convenient to me. Like, why isn't it like that? Um, but yeah, I mean, that's uh, I mean, that's one of the sillier parts of uh, of of the, uh, uh, you know, uh, I mean, that, not, that's not to say that that, that story is silly at all. It's like really, really dark and screwed up. But um, but that part was amusing. Well, no, I've had that thought, John, because I like to pace around in a circle. And I've, I've, I've thought, oh, if I could just have a TV screen on every wall so that I could just, you know, <laughs> shift my gaze from screen to screen as I walk around in a circle and not miss anything. I mean, I'm, I'm way too cheap and lazy to set up anything like that. But, you know. <laughs> Well, Dave, you could just get an i. I mean, you have an iPhone, right? You could just get some video on your iPhone, and you could just walk on a path, and you wouldn't have to walk in a circle. You could just walk on a straight path and just like look at your phone. No, but then I would have to hold the phone up the whole time. <laughs> well, that's true. No, no, I'm too. Late. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I actually, um, uh, to uh, get back to one of your questions earlier about like how do I read all this stuff? Um, actually, lately, uh, I started. Uh, I got I got back into shape after being um, sort of. Uh, I gained a lot of weight after I got married, and so I lost about seventy pounds over the lot over since January. Um, and over the course of this, I started doing a lot of walking, and so like now presently, I'm walking like two and a half to five miles a day. Um, and the only way I can do that to like spend the time doing that is um, I'm I'm actually reading on my Kindle as I walk. Um, and so, you know, it, it does suck that I actually have to hold up the Kindle the whole time, you know, and, and so like actually I'm getting, uh, uh, very tan in this one part of my hand and <laughs> where, and, and the, and the little gap, uh, between your, between my, uh, my four, my, before, between my index finger and my thumb, like, because I'm holding the Kindle, like that part never gets tan. So I have this little, like, triangle of just paleness. It's kind of, uh, sad, but, um, but, you know, so I am getting a lot of reading done. And it's like it's it's kind of nice in a way because I can kind of isolate myself. It's almost like um, in openness when when they like shut everything off and it's like, OK, no, just turn out, turn out all the feeds. You know, like when I'm out there walking and just reading, I, I mean, I do have my phone with me, so I could actually go look at the Internet, but I don't. So it's it's nice. It's a nice way to sort of isolate myself a little bit and just focus. No, I saw your post, John, and I, I realized that you're actually skinnier than I am now. So ah, I'm gonna awesome. have to I'm gonna have to start, you know, doing that. I'm gonna have to start reading, you know, uh, <laughs> walking while I read, so I can reclaim yeah. my my uh, place as skinniest uh, Geeks Guide to the <laughs> Galaxy producer slash host. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, you have to be much more careful walking around New York doing that. Like, I mean, <laughs> where I, you know. I, I mean, first of all, there's a walking path that I go to, so it's actually, you know, it's even better than just oh, walking see, that, around. That, I mean, that's cheating. Well, it is cheating, but then, um, also in, in where I, where I live, like, I could totally just walk around the neighborhood and it'd be fine. There's not that much traffic. I mean, there's, you know, um, uh, but I, I wouldn't, I would be afraid to do it in New York. I mean, besides the fact, uh, you know, cars and tripping over shit and, uh, you know, you just have to worry about people messing with you because, like, you know, you're just oblivious to what's going on, but. Yeah. See, Charlie, do you have any, uh, anything you want to add here? <laughs> no, I'm just imagining John with this really, like, tan hand with one white spot and <laughs> that i assume the hand is also very strong and muscular because it's also gripping so your body <laughs> is like sort of you're sort of like modding yourself you know based on your uh intellect like your brain is slowly modding <laughs> your body um no i i was taking i was taking long walks when i was trying to finish a novel and uh it was really helpful, but after about a week, I realized that I, sh I really needed to put on sunscreen because I was, uh, I, yeah, I, I had completely transformed my whole face and body, it, and I had the deepest uh, uh, flip-flop tan I have ever seen on any. It, it looked like, I mean, it was ridiculous. It looked like I was wearing flip-flops. So um, I was wondering if you, if, if you have tried the, and I'm not advocating for this, the, because your Kindle can probably read to you, right? In the way that your phone can, or 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 does Kindle? Kindle has that, I think, right? You can. But uh, I'm not I, but, sure. But, I'm not sure if it does. I think. I think uh, probably it does. I mean, I, I mean, in any case, I have. I do have Kindle on my iPhone also, so I mean, I could use it if I want to. But um, I, I don't think that they do that very well yet. I mean, I think Dave, you've you've experimented with that, haven't you? Like you've had um, like the the that text to speech thing. Uh, yeah, do that for a while. Yeah, like before, 
the podcast took over my life when I was writing fiction. I would write, I would take the story I was working on and I would export it as an MP3. You know, I would use text to speech software to turn it into an MP3 and then put it on my um, MP3 player and then listen to it. And I would walk around the neighborhood and listen to it to see how it worked. You know, if, if it got turned into a podcast or something, how it would work. Uh, I actually thought that worked really well. I The problem I have um, doing that for, for, for this kind of stuff is that so many of the, um, the Kindle books and stuff are DRMs and you can't, mm-hmm. it's, it's just, I, maybe there's probably a way to do it, but it's, it's a, enough of a pain to try to get it onto my iPod in audio, you know, text to speech yeah. form that I just never do it. Um, yeah. but it, I, yeah, it, I think it's a good idea. I think, yeah, I think the Kindle app actually has like a feature for it or something because it's like, it's like an accessibility thing. Um, and I think it's supposed to be built in or something, but I don't know. Uh, I, I just assumed that it wasn't going to be a very good experience, so I haven't bothered with it. But, um, yeah, I started – before I started reading on the Kindle, I mean, I was actually um, – I, I mean, I was also walking my dog, so that was one of the reasons I was out there walking. But um, I uh, I was, like, listening to podcasts and stuff because, you know, that's one of the ways I keep up with uh, Best American Reading also because uh, certain magazines like Clark's World and Be- and Beneath Cecil Skies and Strange Horizons, they have podcasts all- also, so – um, so I can listen to some of the stories rather than read them, at least on my first read. Um, and so I was doing that for a while, but then like I'll, I'd catch up on those and then I wouldn't have anything else. And so, um, so I, I was like listening to some uh, audiobooks and stuff, but then I was like, it was a lot harder to, to keep the, you know, the walking regimen going when I'm just like listening to an audiobook just for fun or for, you know, just for, you know, reading pleasure. Like, you know, um, it's like, eh, it's all kind of work because I'm, you know, I'm just reading science fiction things, but it's like, well, but I don't need to be reading this. And I do have a ton of stuff that I do need to be reading. So, um, so I had to figure out this, uh, alternative solution. Yeah. All right, well, let's get back to some of these stories. So, I mean, I did mm-hmm. want to mention a couple other examples of technology I thought could actually – I could see happening. And, John, you mentioned in the story Openness, there's this technology called Layers, which is basically – the way I gather it is that everyone has this sort of augmented reality thing where everyone you see on the street, there's kind of this cloud of information around them. Like, like it's like their Facebook profile is kind of floating in the air around them, and you can set your privacy settings however you want or whatever. But so it means if you just see someone, um, you know, on the subway – uh, you can sort of see what their superficial layer of information that they've made public is. And you can be like, oh, we have the same favorite band or like whatever mm-hmm. and, and uh, send, start messaging them. And I could totally see something like that happening. Yeah, definitely. Um, but yeah, that was what that was. the, the uh, That was the other one I was saying, you know, seemed like a Black Mirror episode. I mean, it's like it, um, it, it's it's a little it's it's not quite dark enough, like I was saying. But I mean, um, but it does deal with a lot of those same issues where it's like it it's like um because because essentially black mirror is like about um you know how we interface with technology or the dark side of how we interface with technology and and this sort of delves into that where it's like you know in a lot of ways it seems like this really interesting um thing to do and way to live but then there's all these hidden complications to it that you don't really think of and until you know as it explores in the story um and so I, i thought that was really interesting um how that all plays out but I agree that I could definitely I could definitely see that happening, regardless of whether or not it's a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and just the, the other ones I have on my list here are the uh, the advertisements projected on the clouds and on deer and on residential houses and just ads everywhere. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm I'm sort of terrified of that happening. <laughs> yeah. And, and then this other one I thought was brilliant is the smart pants, where you have these pants that can change <laughs> shape and they're kind of oh, like yeah. linked to the cloud to follow fashion and they just change. <laughs> so, so that they're always updated with the latest fashion moment by moment. I thought that was pretty genius. Yeah, that is key. Although that it, my Wi-Fi cuts out so often, that would be scary. Because <laughs> then what happens? <laughs> yeah, that would be such. A, that would be so embarrassing. Like your pants would be stuck in like a, a trend from like two minutes ago, and and then like how could you ever show your face again after that? Well, there's that, and I was also thinking, what if your then your pants are just not available? So, like, what is the oh, default yeah. pants? Are you just uh-huh. are you just in your underwear? <laughs> so you would, I guess you would, yeah. Um, yeah, it's weird how, uh, to Dave's point, like these technologies, um, I mean, has it always been like this? But it just feels like, uh, you know, like someone, either an alien race or like, uh, like the government could use this book as like R&D, like just like ideas <laughs> for things that they should be developing. Like someone somewhere at the Pentagon is like, oh, yeah, we need smart pants. So they're just getting to work on it now because they know <laughs> about it. But yeah. 
Yeah, no, I, I think the Pentagon should buy a hundred million dollars worth of copies of this book. I think that that would. I be agree. Good. That would be good. <laughs> um. Yeah. Yeah, they could they could check out Charlie's uh, introduction and 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 see the see what's uh, what he's talking about in there and maybe like do something about this whole timeline situation we got going here. This uh, you know. Well, well no, yeah, this is totally a national security defense issue, right? <laughs> yeah. Because this book, as we learned from Charlie's intro, did save the human race from aliens, right? We did, yes. It, it was, a, yes, right. I, I mean, I don't want to pat ourselves on the backs, but it was, <laughs> it's a pretty important book, so. Well, no, say, say more about your intro, Charlie. Um. Well, I mean, yes, to go back to the very beginning, we we're in, uh, we're in the, given the state of the country and the current administration, uh, it, it seems that, uh, we're either in some kind of, um, forking branching path where we've gone down the wrong one and we need to figure out how to get ourselves out, which will probably involve aliens and some sort of higher dimensional beings or, um, or we're in a simulation. I don't know which one, but <laughs> I was in the intro. I, I sort of imagined um, a, or, or did I imagine? I, I, I'm writing about how this book is actually crucial to the fate of our particular timeline because it's you know taking these twenty stories together. It's a uh, a kind of not just a snapshot, but really a. Uh, at the risk of sounding pretentious, it's really kind of a document about, you know, civilization as it is and and as a bunch of really smart, creative people think it should or could be or, you know, or or scary scenarios that we want to avoid. And, you know, I imagine if if someone from a different planet or galaxy did read this, um, it would give them a kind of. Uh, um, you know, it, it like it, it. You could do worse than reading this volume as an example of like sort of what we think of ourselves and what we're scared of and what we hope for. So, um, I, I in a lot of ways, I look at the table contents and I feel really um, like it does reflect a lot of the anxieties that you know a lot of people are feeling right now, including myself. And it does also reflect the best of what we can imagine, um, if that makes any sense. Well, I was, was kind of I wanted to ask you about that, John, because this book collects stories that were mostly published in 2016, or I guess they were mm -hmm. all published in 2016. Yeah. And so we're probably most mostly written in 2016 or earlier. Um, right. So people it's not really um, reflecting people's knowledge that Trump is now president. Right. <laughs> right. Are you seeing are you seeing um, a reaction to that in stuff that is coming into the to, to your slush piles and stuff now? Oh yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, yeah, you can see the you can see the anxieties of writers in in the stories they submit uh, basically all the time, but especially in uh, in times like these when um, you know so much is at stake and so much seems uncertain. And uh, um, yeah, I mean, I, I was just I was sort of thinking like jokingly like, uh, well, clearly the most ridiculous story in this book is uh, the Carolyn Yoakum story because like you know, ha, the thought that we would have insurance. That's ridiculous. Um, you know, it's like, sure, there's still going to be plenty of, uh, plenty of, uh, issues at the medical clinic, but, you know, that whole insurance thing, that just won't even be a factor. So, um, but, uh, well, and it's yeah. not, it's not as if dystopian fiction was mm -hmm. uncommon even <laughs> right. before this, right? So is it, is it becoming even more common? Like, like, or is it just changing to a different form or what's happening? Um, well, I mean, yeah, I think it's just sort of becoming more common. I don't know, uh, if it's necessarily changing to a different form, but I mean, I think, I, I think people are sort of, um, thinking more with, uh, sort of resistance in mind, you know, that kind of, uh, not necessarily just, uh, uh, dystopian, uh, you know, terrible dark futures, but thinking of how to write something that sort of, um, is like a rebellion against, you know, the status quo, as it were. So. Uh, I, I think that's that's the sort of thing that I'm seeing more of an uptick in. But hmm. I mean, in the intro, John mentions Charlie that you had a story published in the New Yorker this past year. Could you talk about that? Yes, uh, I published a story called Fable um, in 2016, and it is from the. It's it's basically about a. It's told as a sort of fable about a guy who is a lawyer slash. Uh, blacksmith. I mean, his dream 
he went to law school, but his dream is actually to be a blacksmith. And um, he, in the course of the story, we get basically a few iterations of him trying to tell the story of his life to his therapist. And as, as is slowly revealed throughout the course of the story, um, he's had some great sort of um, challenges as, you know, as a parent and as a husband and just for himself in sort of figuring out what he's supposed to be doing, um, what, what he's meant to do in, and, and, you know, he's kind of grappling with this feeling of like, isn't there something that I'm supposed to be the best at, or isn't there a quest that is meaningful that I should go on? Or how do I kind of think of myself in, um, in mythical terms, if that makes any sense. So it's, it's kind of like, a, a taking sort of the modern contemporary mind and trying to place it in the context of, of a fable. And I wrote that story actually, um, using technology. I wrote it, uh, in the car, mostly on dictation, uh, which is probably kind of dangerous. Um, <laughs> cause I would have to go like dictation works fine. And most of the time, but often, uh, I was finding that as I was writing it, it was sometimes turning out sentences that were like gobbledygook. And so I would then have to try to remember what actually I said. So sometimes I'd be editing on the road. Please, I hope there are no like, <laughs> I don't know if I can be retroactively given a ticket for doing this, but <laughs> sometimes I'd be editing the story on my phone. Um, but yeah, I wrote basically the first draft while driving back and forth, you know, to work, which was at that time, which was... Uh, the writer's room for Westworld. And it was just a story that kind of came out one day. Um, and it was, it was fun. It, the first thing I had written in a while because I had been sort of blocked. I had massive sort of struggles with this novel for a couple of years. And so uh, my book agent said, why don't you try a story? And I said, yeah, that's a good idea. And so I tried <laughs> and this is the story that resulted and it felt great. It felt good to finish something, which I think is really important sometimes when you are working on something that never seems to um, be satisfactory. Sometimes just finishing something shorter can be really uh, rewarding. That would be a good dystopian science fiction story where the police listen to podcasts <laughs> and then go, you know, give people tickets and things based on confessions they've made <laughs> on the air. Well, yeah, we've got the Pentagon and the CHP listening to yeah. this podcast. Right now. <laughs> I mean, I think just in case all police should definitely listen to the podcast uh, and see what uh, sort of tips they might come up with, like, you know, for, 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 uh, you know, cases they could make, you know, like, I mean, cause who knows? I mean, you should definitely listen to Geek's Guide to the Galaxy every episode. All of you, <laughs> all throughout the country, definitely listen to, to, to every episode. Uh, that would be very helpful to law enforcement, I think. <laughs> uh, but, oh, and also you should buy Best American Science Fiction and Fantasy, but, um, uh, but, you know, one thing at a time. <laughs> well, that actually kind of leads in, John, to talking about your, uh, the, the, um, thing you talk about in your intro about supporting things you love, because, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, there's you, you talk about how shows we've talked about on this podcast, like Brain Dead and Incorporated, both got canceled, even though they were pretty good. And I'm just like living in absolute and um, Sense Eight got canceled, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm just living in absolute terror that the Expanse is going to get canceled. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, I don't know, Charlie. You you've worked in the TV industry now. Do you have any uh, insight onto how we can keep shows, these good science fiction shows, on the air? Um, no, <laughs> no, I, you know, yeah, it's a bummer, especially because, you know, in some ways I think it's, it's, uh, and it's, it's never been better for, I, I don't think, at, at least as a viewer in the, I'm, you know, I'm 41. So I watch shows in the eighties and nineties and up till now. And I feel like the breadth and quality of what's on now genre in general but science fiction specifically is incredible um but it's yeah it's that that also comes i think the price of that is that there's more churn unfortunately you know we don't all get to just turn it tune into mm -hmm. the next gener you know next generation or something that that everybody's watching you know 15 million people or whatever are watching it's now splinters and it in some ways it feels familiar to me it's sort of like the fiction world <laughs> you know it's like uh, you're going to find pockets and things you love and 
and things that you'll stay with for a while. But you, those pockets, most of them aren't, aren't going to be very big. I don't, I don't know how we can mobilize, uh, you know, other than just getting people to watch it. I mean, you know, I will say on the other, uh, this, this is, I don't know if this is insider knowledge or not, but it, I have talked to people too, you know, uh, I guess development people or executives in TV who it does seem clear that, that, um, they definitely understand that the engagement of fans is both important and really, you know, kind of vital. Like it, there, there's something that happens in the, you know, you guys know what I'm talking about. I think like when the right mix of like internet, you know, commenters and podcasts and, you know, convention goers and just sort of, you get that kind of right mix of people who really, truly passionately love something. That doesn't mean it'll necessarily save something from cancellation, but there is a kind of long tail to it or a kind of like, here's something that has resonated with people. And even if it, let's say, only lasts two or three seasons, will stay in the public's imagination and live on and could come back. I mean, that's another thing, right? Like, you see zombie things get revived much quicker than they used to be now for better or worse. But I think for better sometimes where there are possibilities for something to show up on a different network or for, or to get rebooted or to spin off into something. Um, and for, and, and if no, nothing else, then it just lives on because everything on the internet will live on forever. Right. And so um, I think, you know, all of which is to say, I think even if something gets canceled, sometimes it, it's it's neat to have that thing that only lasted like that perfect three seasons or something. And then you, you know, you get to have that forever. Well, I mean, we are getting a, uh, a wrap up episode or two episodes or something of Sense8 as a result of fan mm -hmm. outcry. So I just wish there was some, you know, some uh, like union or something. I don't know, some guild or mm -hmm. something where it wasn't just these... Um, you know, people are throwing together these efforts every time it happens, but there's some, you know, organized constituency, which would be advocating on a consistent basis to keep these good, high quality science fiction shows going. Yeah. You know well, what I mean, it I, might be? Yeah. Oh, go ahead, John. I'm sorry. I'm oh. rambling about this, but I had one more thought, which is it, the, the, to your point, Dave, it, it, there could be a situation in a couple of years where, or whenever it is in a few years where we're literally watching like you won't watch a channel anymore. You'll just watch an app or you'll watch like a very narrow cast of thing where if something like that happened, the model is so different because either on the front end, it's funded already by people who support that, you know, by purchasing, like, would you subscribe to this show? Yes. So then it's going to stay as long as enough people want to watch that. And, or, I mean, I could imagine a situation where something was canceled and then you know, I don't know that this infrastructure currently exists, but let's say 300,000 people passionately love something and would be willing to pay $10 a year or something to watch mm -hmm. that show. Wouldn't that be enough to fund six or eight episodes a year? I mean, I, it's not ima impossible to imagine that, that model, you know, existing in a way that could not just on a kind of one-off basis, like you're saying, but in a kind of organized basis, like, okay, we are canceled by the network, but now go here and we could live on, you know, mm -hmm. I don't know. Well, that yeah, that would be interesting if, if the networks would become like basically pilots, like extended pilots, basically. And, mm -hmm. you know, you know, you, you watch the show, you watch new shows on the networks. And then once they inevitably get canceled, then, <laughs> you know, you go over to the app or whatever for their for their actual like long lifespan. Mm hmm. Yeah, I mean, what, what I was going to say is, uh, I, and we talked about this on, on our panel talking about how to save shows from being canceled. Um, uh, you know, I mean, it's infuriating to me as a fan to have discovered that like, oh, well, like when I'm watching a show, when I record something on my TV, it's like it doesn't even count as a viewer. Like, I don't even count as a viewer. It's like the fact that they're still using like the Nielsen model to like measure like viewership. It's like that makes me like crazy because I'm like, what? There, you, you got to. There's got to be a better way at this point, like, you know, and, and um, so, I mean, it, it just goes to show, like, how much, like, as a fan, you really need to, uh, you know, get out there and really, really support the things that you love as much as you can, because, like, you know, even if you just watch it every week or whatever, like, it might not even be counted, you, you know, your viewer number might not even be counted. 
Um, and so that's where, you know, the engagement comes into play. You know, it's like you got to get out there, talk about it and, and do whatever you can or, or find out the ways that do get counted as uh, viewership numbers, which apparently streaming numbers do count. But, you know, just recording something off broadcast does not count. Um, so, so yeah, there's all these things like that. But, I mean, you know, the larger point I was making in my forward is that, um, you know, uh, this same sort of thinking applies to books. It applies to magazines. Like, I see people a lot of time talk about how, oh, I'm not going to read that series until it's finished. And, and, you know, it's like, well, that's going to make sure the series <laughs> is never finished because people can't, you know, like, a, a, a publisher won't continue a book series if everybody just waits until seven books get published to to, to buy it. Um, and, um, but, but I mean, the same thing is true of, um, and, and perhaps most true for, for these different magazines and, and anthologies that all these places where you find short stories, it's like short stories probably has the least funding of anything that, uh, that we've talked about. So they really need the support the most. So like, I mean, if you read something like Best American and you, and you, you know, you love, uh, the story from Fireside or you love this story from Tor.com, you know, it's like, do your best to like try to go and check out those places and and find other stories in there that you like and like support them however you can whether it's just like giving them clicks you know going through the site and and and, and reading things or or if they have a patreon or that kind of thing or if they have subscriptions you know support them that way if if, if it's something that you like um just because it's like you know we can't do best american science fiction and fantasy if if these publications go away so um, and I mean, not that, not that there's like a bunch of them that are just like on the verge of going away, but, um, you know, they all have, they all need support and they, and, no, and none of them really have the support that they should have. Uh, cause a lot of these are like sort of very part-time jobs or they at least get paid as if they're very part-time jobs. Um, so yeah. Anyway, point being, you got to support these things. Well, right. And, and as we mentioned earlier, for Best American Science Fiction and Fantasy, this is on a two-year renewal basis, mm -hmm. basic, basically. And I think it would just be such a – so heartbreaking if this series were to end. So, you know, these are, this is, this is a, a great group of stories in this book. I mean, usually, um, you know, I'll put together lists of like, books I read and which stories I like the best. And usually mm -hmm. I don't have much trouble ordering it. You know, like I, I know very clearly which one I liked first, second, third, fourth, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And this one, I, I was really having a lot of trouble deciding mm. how to order them because uh, maybe because there are the more metafictional and experimental stories. It's hard to be like, OK, well, this one is like, you know, it, it, there, there's so many different vectors of quality going on that it's mm. uh, it was it, it was harder for me to rank them. Mm -hmm. Well, that's nice to hear. Yeah, that is good. <laughs> um. Yeah, I, I hope everyone listening orders at least a thousand copies. That, <laughs> Write your congressman and, and tell them to to get the Pentagon to. Uh, <laughs> we need a, a block grant would be good. Yeah, right. Um, then the other thing I want to bring up is that this may be a little academic, but um, you had a line in your uh, forward, John, where you say science fiction and fantasy, though they seem to be about. The future or fictional worlds are always at their core about the problems and issues of today. Mm -hmm. And I want to take a pick a slight bone with that, because I do agree that um, commenting on issues of the day through science fiction is something that science fiction definitely does. And one of the most important things that it does. Mm -hmm. But I just have a problem with like always at their core about problems sure. and issues of the day, um, because I think that, you know, I mean, it's, and it's kind of impossible probably to get outside your context but it does seem to me like what classically one of the goals of science fiction is to write a novel that, you know, it could be like a novel, like a realistic novel in 2050 or something, but you're reading it now and mm -hmm. it's not, you know, tied to this, to the time period that it's written in, in any particular way. Um, so I don't know. Do you, what do you think about that? Yeah, no, I mean, uh, yeah, I, I probably shouldn't have said always, um, but, uh, yeah, no, I mean, I take, I take your point. I mean, I think, uh, yeah, it's like a lot of times it is certainly, um, I mean, there probably could find some examples, uh, where, where that's not the case. Um, so yeah, maybe I shouldn't use the word always, but, um, but I mean, I think, um, you know, even, even a story, uh, I mean, if you sort of boil it down to its core, like, you know, even, even something that's just, you know, some sort of far future space opera thing or whatever, it's like there's, it seems it almost seems like you know you you can't really fully divorce it from from like contemporary thoughts you know it's like it's going to be informed by it to some degree so i mean i guess that's what i was thinking by um phrasing it the way i did but 
Um, but I mean, I guess, you know, at, at a certain point, it's like, well, it's like it's so slight that it's uh, not really relevant enough to, to warrant, um, you know, being grouped in that way that like I did. So um, I think you're probably right. I went a bit far. <laughs> yeah, I mean, because just to me, there's a difference between saying it's, um, you know, about today's issues versus it's about the human condition or universal human concerns mm -hmm. or something. And, yeah. um, you know, I think good art is probably always about the latter. Um, and good mm -hmm. art can very well be about the former, but doesn't necessarily have to be. Yeah, in yeah, John's true. In John's defense, <laughs> uh, not that he needs a defense, but um, and not that you're attacking him, but uh, <laughs> I, I, I think it's interesting. You know, you had mentioned earlier, and rightly, Dave, that uh, these stories were published in 2016, and and I'm remembering that you know, obviously, when I read them, it was 2017, and wrote my you know uh, piece, the introduction that. It was obviously 2017 as well. And there is a kind of, and I, this might have nothing to do with sort of what the specific point you're making. Um, but, um, there is, there was certainly a, and is for me a very powerful kind of, you know, thing hanging over everything. <laughs> and, 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 and in, in fact, in such a way, in, to, to the extent that not only when I was reading them, but even, now that I'm thinking about them, I still see them in a way that that it's hard for me to divorce from the current circumstances. So I think in some ways, the volume for me is very, even though, you, again, you're right that the stories were published and, pro and almost certainly written before the possibility of Trump being president was it seemed re remotely possible. Um, it's now hard to imagine, you know, them divorced from that for me in a way. Um, and, and so... I, for whatever reason, felt like there was a lot more weight attached to a lot of certain elements of the stories. Not, not that I sort of picked them for their social, you know, activism or for any kind of message, but that they, um, that when they hang together, when I look at it now, it's hard for me to separate from that, if that makes any sense. No, it does. And I, I, I... I agree that, I mean, most stories are a product of their time. And I mean, maybe all stories are a product of their time. I don't know. But it just seems to me that science fiction is so much about the the breadth of the universe and the vast spans of time that I think at least aspirationally, I would mm -hmm. like it to the, the possibility to be out there that it's not just always about looking at, at our current circumstances, that it's, mm -hmm. it can it can be more it can it can do other things than than that in addition to that. Definitely. Yeah, I mean, I guess I'd like to, I'd like to find that story or, or novel, um, and, and, and see what it was like. If it was like, you know, the, uh, something that really did do exactly what you're talking about, like it, it you know, to, to the, the furthest extent, furthest extent possible, um, you know, just completely divorce itself from, you know, our contemporary thinking and, and, and have a, a true, like, sort of futuristic vision, uh, vision, like, uh, not, not so tied to, you know, how we currently are. That would be, I mean, that would be really fascinating to see. Um, uh, it pulled off really well. Yeah. I mean, because the way I would think about it is like if you, um, if you were to write a novel set in today, write a novel set in 2017, a realistic novel about cyberbullying or something, right? Mm -hmm. If mm -hmm. someone in 1962 had written that exact same book, you know, that would just be an incredible accomplishment mm -hmm. of imagination and, uh, you know, world building and everything, right? It seems like that's one thing that it w w w and it would not be about 1962, right? It would be about 2017. And it seems like that's something that is at least a worth a worthy goal to strive toward in some, you know, in some works. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so, yeah, I guess that's pretty much all the stuff I had to talk about. I guess you, you did say, John, um, uh, after more than 15 years working in the SFF field, I found 2016 to be an entirely new challenge as I threw myself into the world of novel editing. I guess in our, in our last couple of minutes here, is there anything else you want to say about what it's like getting into science fiction novel editing when that's uh, something new to you? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, it, you know, obviously uh, I have read tons of novels in my life. And I mean, I, you know, I discovered novels before I discovered short stories. So, I mean, it's something I've been familiar with all along uh, as, a, as a reader. Um, but uh, it, it's, it's a quite different experience uh, diving into it as an editor. I mean, both for... Um, you know, the, uh, the process of finding and, and, uh, bidding on novels. And, um, you know, of course, with short stories, I, I, you know, typically, uh, an author sends me a short story and, and nobody else is considering it. I have an exclusive look at it. And so if I want to buy it, I buy it. Um, 
Whereas with a novel, most of the time you don't get it exclusively. You know, several other editors are considering it. So you, so not only is it like, you know, 10 times as long as a short story or more, um, it, it's, so it's not, not only is it much longer than a short story, but like you also have to like read it instantly because, um, otherwise you might miss your chance to get it. So it's like, there's a lot of stress involved with it. Like I, um, I find I have a lot of anxiety over, uh, uh, not diving into a, a novel like as soon as I at least read the first chapter um, as soon as I get it because I want to make sure that I'm on top of um, a hot property if it, if it is if it is one um, you know because uh, there there were a few novels that I had submitted where um, before I really got the hang of it like I got the hang of that notion um, where I, I didn't read it fast enough and so I feel like that hurt me when um, when we went to go try to buy it that like maybe the author um, gave preference to this other editor because, well, they actually read it like overnight or in two days or whatever. Um, and so, and I mean, I probably, I mean, I would have as well if I realized like, Oh geez, I need to really jump on top of this and it's going to all happen really fast. Um, so, uh, so, I mean, that's probably been the biggest, um, change. Um, I mean, other, otherwise just, you know, obviously the novel form is somewhat different than short stories. Um, it's, uh, um, there's a lot more structural work, uh, that you run into as an editor with short stories. Um, uh, m- most of the time it's, uh, you know, anything that requires any sort of drastic restructuring, in most cases, you're just not going to accept it. Um, you know, you would, you know, just pass on such stories, uh, in most cases. Um, and of course, short stories are being much smaller or, or, you know, have, have less of that to worry about. Um, but. Yeah, but I mean, it's been really interesting, and I'm really happy with uh, the list. Um, I mean, if you go to johnjoesfathomsbooks.com, you can see some of the books that we have coming out and uh, um, and all that and keep up with everything that way. Yeah, yeah, everyone definitely do that, johnjoesfathomsbooks.com. And then, Charlie, uh, do you want to just talk about what are you up to these days? Is there anything, any projects you want to let people know about or anything they should go check out? Sure, yes. I'm. Uh, we. I don't know if we talked about it. Before we started recording or not, but uh, I'm currently working on a show for HBO as one of the you know writers. Uh, the show is created the sh- uh, creator and showrunner is Alan Ball, who uh, obviously created Six Feet Under and True Blood, um, and it's um, it's a it's a family drama set in Portland that possibly has some uh, genre uh, or or even supernatural elements, um, depending on how we want to characterize it, but, um, so that's, that's been a lot of fun and, uh, I'm getting ready to be on set to cover my episode, um, for season one, which will be really, really neat. And then I'm actually, yeah, I just finished a a draft of my next book or what I hope will be my next book, a novel. So it's with my editor and agent now. If they don't kick it back to me, then <laughs> presumably that book will come out sometime in the next 50 years, but we'll see. <laughs> um, and so does that novel or that show that you're working on, are there titles for those? Uh, I don't know that we have we have a permanent title. I think um, I think there have been things floated around probably in the press, but I'm not exactly sure. But, it you know, it's the Allen Ball HBO upcoming show, and it should be out sometime next year i would think so um and and your your upcoming novel does that have a title uh same thing i i i have a title (laughs) i don't know if my editor agrees with my title so i probably shouldn't say it because i i've actually already made the mistake of saying different versions of that title in things that were published or recorded (laughs) so there's like (laughs) six different titles of this book now um so yeah so sadly i cannot give a title for that. And oh, I guess one very John Joseph Adams specific thing that I can probably share, but again, with only some details, is uh I the story standard loneliness package that John published years ago in Lightspeed um had been optioned by Fox Searchlight for to oh. possibly make as a movie years ago. It they did not make a movie out of it. Um so I got the rights back uh earlier this year and um, since, uh, basically since the, the first time we, we, we sold the rights, um, I've started working in TV. I, you know, together with my agents decided it would be a good candidate to try to develop myself for TV. So I am lucky enough to be currently writing, uh, or will be soon writing a pilot based on that story, kind of expanding it out into more of a world. Cause it's obviously just one story, but 
trying to figure out how to do that. And it's not, hasn't been, you know, greenlit or anything, but, uh, you know, a studio bought the pilot and a producer is attached. Uh, at some point I should be able to talk about that, but unfortunately not right now, but I wanted to hmm. share that news. So it's very exciting for me. It's the first thing I'm basically developing for myself based on one of my own things. Yeah. Congratulations. Yeah. That's really, really cool. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Congrats. That, that sounds great. And it's all thanks to John Joseph Adams and the late speed magazine. Yes, <laughs> exactly. Um, so, so Charlie, if people want to keep up on news of those different projects and stuff, do you have a, a website or Twitter or what's the best way to keep up with your happenings? I think Twitter probably, uh, uh, Charles underscore YU. And, uh, I will try to be better about updating things as they, as I have things to update, but I think I will be because this is now, um, my own stuff and it's easier to talk about. It's one thing when you're kind of on a, uh, on someone else's show, it's sort of hard to talk about what's going on without, you know, spoiling things or overstepping. But uh, if if and when things, you know, news to break, I will definitely keep it updated there. And hopefully I could, you know, come talk about it. If it ever turns into something, come back on this <laughs> show and talk about it. Yeah, absolutely. No, I mean, you're one of our uh, our old school original uh, guests. So uh, we're always happy oh, to have yeah. you back. <laughs> Sweet. Episode 24, OG. <laughs> yes. Original Geekster. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, actually, uh, I was going to mention also, um, since this is going to be airing ahead of this, um, uh, we're doing a Best American Science Fiction and Fantasy 2017 event at Dark Delicacies in Burbank, California on October 18th. Um, so you can go to my website for more information about that, or you can go to Dark Delicacy's website for that, but it's, uh, you know, October 18th, um, me and Charles Yu will be there, and then plus contributors Lee Bardugo, Brian Evanson, and Greg Van Eekhout will all be there as well, so we're going to be doing a little panel discussion, and then we'll have a signing, so that should be fun. Yes. Will you be signing body parts? <laughs> uh, I mean, I guess we could, but I was hoping to sign books. <laughs> Yeah, people bought. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so yes, yeah, so I think we're we're all out of time. So I think we'll wrap things up there. So we've been speaking with John Joseph Adams and Charles Yu. So guys, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks so much. It was a lot of fun. Always good to be here. And that was our panel. So big thanks again to John Joseph Adams and Charles Yu for joining us on the show. Big thanks as well to everyone who's given us five stars on iTunes, including David B. Holbrook in the U.S. and Joe Curtis 87 in the U.K. Joe Curtis 87 writes, I've been listening to Geek's Guide for years and would recommend it to anyone who's interested in science fiction literature, TV, or movies. There's fantastic interviews with authors like Neil Gaiman and Kazuo Ishiguro. And David Barr Kirtley is a great host whose questions are steeped in his passion for science fiction, yet the show is always accessible enough for newcomers curious about the genre to really enjoy themselves. So big thanks again to Joe Curtis 87 for that great review. Special thanks as well to Brian Hunt, who just signed up this week to support us on Patreon. Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is made possible thanks to support from listeners like you. So if you enjoy the show and want it to continue, please sign up to give us a dollar or two per episode over at patreon.com slash geeks. And if you'd rather make a one-time contribution, you can do that via check or PayPal over at geeksguideshow.com slash crowdfunding. So big thanks again to everyone who's contributed. We really appreciate it. I'd also like to thank Got Science, the new podcast from the Union of Concerned Scientists, for sponsoring today's show. Learn more over at gotsciencepodcast.org. All right, so that was our show. So thanks, everyone, for listening, and we'll see you next time. The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is a production of Wired.com. For more information about the show, visit geeksguideshow.com. To learn more about your host, visit davidbarrkirtley.com. Music and voiceover produced by yours truly, Jack Kincaid. If you enjoyed this program, tell your friends. If you didn't enjoy it, tell no one. Thank you for listening.